What's up, everybody? And welcome back to Hypodermic, the pod that sticks you deep. I'm the pod boss, TJ Bowser. Joining me, as always, is the maestro of mayhem, the commandant of chaos, Mr. Nick Benson. How are you doing today, TJ? Better now that you're here, buddy. So we have a very special guest today. I am super excited to have her on. I am a big fan of her work. But Nick, I will let you introduce her. Have at it, buddy. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, this lady uh, is quite an inspiration to me. I, uh, I, Before I was even thinking about what I wanted to do in this business, uh, I was watching movies she was in and a little crushing on her a little bit. Uh, I got the the luxury of meeting her. I believe it was 2020 when we met. We were at a show together uh, side by side. We were also in an issue of uh, some crazy magazine, some horror magazine together. Um, but uh, the name escapes me right now. But uh, I I would love to introduce to you guys actress, pr- producer, and author, Miss Tony Hudson. <laughs> I was trying to find that magazine because I just saw it. I've been moving in. <laughs> Yeah, uh, slowly from stuff. From you stuff. remember that, huh? <laughs> that yeah, was fun. No. Yeah, because I think fun. I was on the cover. Yeah, yeah, you were. Of that particular. Yeah. Um, yeah. So much fun. Well, thank you guys for having me. I'm happy to be here. Nice to Absolutely. see you. Absolutely, we are yeah. we are honored to have you here, and it's uh it's it's pretty cool because you know you have a pretty expansive television and film career as well as being a published author. And uh, I think that's pretty inspiring for a lot of people that listen. So uh, I kind of want to start by telling your story about what led you to do what you wanted to do. Well, I started off in a showbiz type family, but more from the local community theater area from San Bernardino Civic Light Opera that my mother was involved in. So I grew up with her always auditioning and and tap dancing and singing around the house to go audition for this theater. Now, my grandmother owned a dance studio. She taught little boys and girls how to dance and sing, ballet and tap and such. And so my mother was an only child raised kind of like a Shirley Temple. And then in your blood then. So that was kind of, (laughs) it was all around me. Right. And um, we even tried to put an act together for the uh, Lawrence Welk show. Oh, wow. That's how far back. <laughs> uh, called the three generations where we were tap dancing and stuff, but it never came to fruition. But yes, yeah, so I, I started there being in, around it. <clears throat> I would do talent shows in middle school. Mm-hmm. And then I remember uh, seeing a teen magazine and saying, hey, you know, I, I'd like at the grocery store. And I told my mother I'd like to be in one of those. You know, and she's looking at cans and not paying attention. And she says, well, call them up and tell them. Mm-hmm. So I took the magazine home and found in the back of the magazine where it was down on Sunset Boulevard, their teen magazine. And I called them up and told them I wanted to be in their magazine. We'll send us some photos. And I had just happened to have been shopping at the mall at Judy's clothing store. And the owners of Judy's was in there and they saw me and said, Hey, we're going to do a story in the newspaper local. Would you mind trying on some clothes? We'll give you an outfit and we can use your picture. (laughs) I said, sure. So then that started like a little modeling thing of which then a photographer who took the photos was from the Brooks Institute and then had a gig oh, wow. to do how, what F-stops were in photogenic magazine or photography magazine. And he needed a model. So then I ended up modeling. So I started doing that. And then uh, I ended up getting the gig in Teen Magazine. Uh, two months later, I was shooting the Christmas issue. So I was in Teen Magazine just by calling them up and saying, hey, I want to be in there. Oh, wow. That's and uh, cool. they even shot a version of my shoot uh, for a possible cover. I had a box with a bow and red lips. And then they put a candy cane in my mouth and it looked a little too sexy. So they said, no, <laughs> do that. Uh, but I was still inside with, you know, and that started. Then I went to a commercial workshop called We Spare mm-hmm. Hill in Burbank. And they they said, you're a walking commercial. And they got me my first agent, which was at uh, Joseph Helfond and Ricks, which was on Hollywood and Highland, right? Where everything happens now. And uh, yeah, so I went in there and got an agent. And then I had two or three agents. They were all kind of vying for me. I had agents sending me out to see who which one I was going to sign with. That's how mm-hmm. in the commercial world. And then... Um, 
how did I get my theatrical agent? Well, because, oh, because Joseph, no, Joseph Helfond and Riggs, I forget which one, Sandy Joseph um, was married to, or ha her boyfriend was an agent for theatrical. And so she told him, mm -hmm. hey, meet this girl. She's amazing. So I went in and read for him and went, oh my God, you're amazing. And it just kept rolling like that. And I started doing films right away. Wow. I was doing national commercials. I've done over 50 uh, national commercials. Right. And then, um, and then, but it, the first film was Young Doctors in Love. Yeah. That's one of the first ones I saw you in. <laughs> yeah. I was originally hired for three days to be a little candy striper in a scene or two. Right. And it and ended up working 13 weeks and got, I mean, it was a very large cast, 72 players in that cast. Yeah, it was a big, big cast in that film. Yes, and everybody went off to do very amazing things from that. It was Gary Marshall's directorial debut. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I worked with a lot of people, made a lot of friends in that in that experience. But working 13 weeks uh, and watching Gary do what he does, creating the team around him. I mean, yeah, all the all the aspects of movie making kind of dripped on me early. Mm -hmm. You know, that's neat. Yeah, and then and then. Um, so that led to miscellaneous tel television roles, didn't it? Oh sure, yes, I did. Uh, General, you did like Knight Rider and Love Boat and soap operas. I did yeah. Knight Rider, Laverne and Shirley, yeah. A Team, um, Greatest American Hero. Right. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of '80s episodic television. Which was, yeah, it was cool. Know. I remember seeing a lot of you in those days. <laughs> yeah, and my ex-husband starred in one of the most popular ones of that time, which was called The Is that Dirk? Yeah, Dirk was in yeah. the eighth team as Face Man, Temple right. So, um, yeah, I was of that ilk with Stephen J. Cannell, who was, you know, writing and producing everything at that time. Oh, on yeah, LBC. yeah. Everything was a Cannell production at that time. Yeah, yeah. So, um so yeah, I rode that little swirl for a minute, had two babies, you know, in the midst of it. So you walk away from a career when you have children, if you do it yourself. I didn't want to hand my kids over to a nanny. So um, I, you know, I'm the all natural girl. So my company called Correct Living, which is my second book that I wrote. Mm -hmm. um, Correct spelled with a K-E-R-E-K-T. Oh, here's a fun picture that we did for Correct Living. It kind of shows. Oh, yeah. But it's a consciously proactive preventative lifestyle through food, basically, as the basis. But it's body, mind, and spirit. And I've been living that way for over 45 years. And it has seemed to do me well. Episode nine, you know, nine is my life path number. Oh, wow. Like it's meant to be. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, I just thought it was episode nine. That's so, yeah. Cool. Um, so a lot of episodic in that time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then, what brought... Huh? What, was it after the episodic stuff that you got onto uh, just one of the one of the guys? Um. Well, just one of the guys was like my fourth. Or, no. Okay. Okay. I had a, a great experience uh, auditioning and getting the role in a movie called Places in the Heart. Oh, okay. Sally Field won an Academy Award for that movie as best mm -hmm. actress. I think it won several other cinema, cinematography or something. I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure. Um, and yeah, so I had to audition for that part, but it was a quite a unique story because it came down to the, a girl in New York and me, and I didn't know that Oh wow. I had auditioned three and four times for this amazing project and, um, they kept bringing me back and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden I didn't hear and I knew they were getting ready to go to location in Texas. So I called my agent and they said, well, you know, they're already down there. I don't know. I said, well, can you call and tell them I'll come down there? They need to read me again. Oh, well, they're not going to pay for that. No, tell them I'll pay. So mm -hmm. yeah, I did. my agent called them and said, hey, she'll pay herself if you want to read her. Again. And they said, that's eh, not a bad idea. We could read her with the local guy, which is the boyfriend part, you know. So okay. I spent all my money and bought a ticket and flew down to Waxahachie, Texas. Robert Benton was the director and writer of the movie. And uh, auditioned in the evening, and then they said, thank you for coming by. And I had spent all my money on that airplane ticket. I think I had $25 left in my account. It was like $375. Wow. 
five dollars for the ticket to Dallas, Texas. And so now I'm sitting in like the Bates Motel in the lobby <laughs> with my suitcase at ten o'clock in the morning because I had to be out of my room. But my flight's not till six. Yeah. And and it's really like dank and dusty and dark. And all I did is say thanks. And I'm like, and I'm crying the whole night before. Oh. I shouldn't be an actor. I'm just not meant to do this. It's horrible. I mean, they sent Sandra Lee, Robert Benton's assistant, great woman, came up to my room and, and tried to get, you know, me to act better. I mean, how humiliating. Like, you're not good enough. Let me try. Uh, but will you stay and read again in the morning? So I did with the young guy. And again, they said, thank you. So that's when I'm sitting. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, Robert Benton and Sandra Lee behind come walking across this very dark lobby. And um, they said, oh, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I'm waiting because I had to be out of my room and my flight. And I need a driver. And he says, have you eaten lunch? I said, no. He goes, come with me. Mm -hmm. it's, and then he said, and then he stopped and he turned. And I said, because pending <clears throat> me to make a deal, the part is yours. Oh, wow. So he takes me into the parking lot of this motel out in the middle of Waxahachie, Texas, 30 miles south of Dallas, and <laughs> took me out there, and there's all the trailers for production. Right. So you go inside, and it's buzzing with fax machines back then, and the phone's sure. ringing and everything. Lunch is being served. It's all laid out and catered. And he's introducing me to the whole cast. Sally Field comes up and was introduced and said, did you just find out? And I'm like, yeah. And he said, yeah, wow. she's playing at Ermine Hightower. And I, she goes, oh, I just got chills. And, John Malkovich and Danny Glover and yeah, all the cast. So wow, uh, I an had opportunity. Great experience, earned the part, went to Texas, shot the part, and then the whole role basically gets cut out of the movie. Oh, jeez! <laughs> but you bet on yourself, and you got it. Yes, but here's what's there's so many things that come full circle. Oh yes, I still got my credit, still got paid, still had the experience and the credibility in the industry. <clears throat> um, but then. Come around Starfest was in Vegas and Kansas City, and we were we were the one in Can no uh, Show West, excuse me. Okay, Show West. I'm familiar West. with it. Show West, but this was Show Rama, which was in Midwest. Right. Well, I'm going to the Kansas City, but they have this event the night before. I'm Star of the Future, and and Robert Benton was Director of the Year. Oh, and that's fantastic! The director that cut me out of the movie. So there we are, sitting on the same day as John Travolta was International Snow. Uh, was comeback star because of Quentin Tarantino's movie. Wow. And then um, Victor Banerjee was international star from Passage to India. It was quite a, a she she thing. But uh, yeah, so it came back around where Robert and I were sitting on. It was really cool. That's kind of neat. That's great yeah, stuff. That, that, that's, I, I did about four movies intermixed with the 80s television stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And I then know that just one of the guys came. What's that? Then just one of the guys came in as well. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Okay. I originally auditioned for the, the lead role, like most of the girls. Right. They kind of went through the girls they liked and then put us off into categories, you know, prom queen, best mm. friend. <laughs> right, right, right. <clears throat> oh, and then ironically, to tie in some more of Places in the Heart and all of that, the other girl in New York that they were looking at was Deborah Goodrich. Okay. Who plays the prom queen in, in Just One of the Guys. Right. <laughs> so as she's coming to be on location with me, she knows that Tony Hudson's the girl that got the part in the movie that we just <laughs> Oh, oh boy. <laughs> and now we're the, we're the best of friends. Oh, that's fantastic. We've been at each other's weddings and childbirth things, and she's an author uh, with her third book out. She just finished her tour on her third book, which is called Reef Road. So prom queen... Queen from uh, Just One of the Guys is also an author. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's that's super cool. Um, I know that you also worked with a production designer that I worked with named Mick Strawn yes. on Leatherface. And that's yeah. we have a very large horror audience. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to get you here. Um, of course. Can, can you talk a little bit about working on Leatherface and – Exactly. Well, one of those moments where I was having babies, I was in my first trimester of my second child. And so my second child right now is 33 years old. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's how long ago this is. Yeah. But 
I had an audition for a movie and I'm not showing because I'm in my first trimester and I know that I'm, I can still be physical and this, I knew this was a physical role. So I didn't tell anybody that I was pregnant. I just went on the audition. Oh. And when I, and when I went on the audition, of course, this character is basically running in the woods, trying to being chased by Leatherface the whole time, basically. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do you do that in an office? <laughs> I thought to myself, so I went, I know what I'll do. So I went in and I said, can we chat after, not before? Because then it takes you, you, then you know me. And now you have to believe that I'm the girl out in the woods. Right. Be the girl out in the woods first and then we can chat after. And he, oh, he was fine with that. So what I did was, is I just went across the office, which is not very big, into the corner, like into the corner and just slid down into the fetal position. So he had to actually get up from behind the desk to look over to see what the heck I was doing. He couldn't be eating a sandwich and just be leaning back and kicking back. He had to like pay attention. Right. And I just played the crazy girl that was out in the woods and had to eat a fucking rat raw, you know? <laughs> I just got crazy with it. It's all in the corner, you know? But then, you know, and um, I got the part. <laughs> so awesome. I didn't tell anybody I was pregnant. And this is actually on the laser disc, the director's narration. Jeff Burr talks about this. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're about to shoot where Leatherface cuts me in half against the tree. He finally mm -hmm. catches me. And um, so we've got the vroom, <laughs> and we've got the caro syrup with the hose going up my nose. Oh, God. Yeah. And and there's part, they have a rubber person because we had to do the special effects and have a oh, yeah. one of me too. So that I had to, I got to experience that making the mold and all that. And um, yeah, so <laughs> I say, hey Jeff, I just wanted to let you know, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> By the way. <laughs> um, I'm in my first trimester of pregnancy, so I just, you know, I mean, I guess it's, I should have told you. He said, what? Uh -huh. and, uh, and we went, went ahead and shot, and everything was great. <laughs> So did you, I know that there, were, there, there was a lot of, TJ knows more about this than I do, but uh, oh. I know there was a lot of production nightmares with that particular film. Did you experience anything uh, with regards to that? Luckily, actually, I think I was left out of it. Were you? Yeah, I, I think my, I was so only outside, way out in the location near Magic Mountain. Okay. And so night shoots. You know, so right. you're not going to have a lot of the the people behind the scenes on set. They're all sleeping, you know, ready to wake up and yell at the same people tomorrow. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and we're up working the, the the handful of us getting these nighttime shots. Mm -hmm. So I really was kind of removed from any of that kind of stuff, which was great. I, I and it helped me because I needed to be that kind of alone in the woods chick. I love. Right the stuff smoking the cigarette with who's he? Oh, I just forgot his name. It just just left my brain. Wonderful. Uh, Ken. Ken um Forey. Forey. Yeah. Forey, yeah. Yeah, he's great. Oh, it was so fun working with him. He was so fun and um made it really comfortable, you know. We had a lot of fun doing the little cute stuff with the cigarettes and you know. Oh look. <laughs> <laughs> you know and, and 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 like he you know i light it and i give it to him and i act all badass you know give it to him but when he gives it to me and he's gone i'm holding it with two hands like i'm scared as fucking shit like this cigarette is gonna help me <laughs> <laughs> i think mick Strawn has a good story about your death scene and the special effects that went into the, the dummy Mm -hmm. Oh uh, yeah, not really. Uh, there was a dummy created of you, right, with the arms. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I think Mick has a, a a story about the arms malfunctioning over and over again. Uh, yeah, uh, he tells it better. <laughs> uh, check the other our other podcast, Rabbit Hole, for that story. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I haven't heard, because you know I'm just doing my part. You know, if right. I'm yes, involved, that could have been when I'm not even involved as well. That's true. They could have called you in after all that was uh, already solved. Yeah, yeah, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. 
sure. all I know is that I had to do it twice. Ah. So, you know, once once you're all bloodied with mm-hmm. the syrup because a guy's laying on his back with yeah. his, like a, you know, a little paint. The the pressure the pressure hose thing, yeah. Yeah, a little pressure hose, a little spraying you with it. <laughs> well, because he's well, down below, everything's yeah. going. Oh yeah. Every yeah. orifice. So you have to take a shower. They got to dry your hair, but not dry your hair, and then get the blood out so it can be blood for the first yeah. time. And all of the re getting ready again to be dirty to be even dirtier. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's but that's fun. That's play, right? That's no <laughs> complaining about it at all. It's 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 a gift to be able to do that and get paid for it. So it's you know it's a lot of work to do those those scenes, and it. It is very tough on actors. I don't. I don't think a lot of people understand how tough that can be on an actor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And imagine doing it pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There right, you well, go. I, I thought the emotions would work well. If yeah. I had me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that probably helped a lot. Oh sure. <laughs> and, um, yeah, no, it, it's it wasn't it wasn't uh, to me. Sometimes those kind of parts are easier mm-hmm. because you have all the the wardrobe and the blood and the preparation to make it look gory, right? And so that helps the whole process. You know, when you have to just strip down and have a straight conversation and have it be believable, sometimes it's like, oh, <laughs> sure, you can't hide behind anything. Sure. All that stuff kind of helps immerse you in the part. So I, I think, think so. Yeah. 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 And obviously Jeff Burr is great to work with. Love him. Yeah. I've, Jeff's, I've, Jeff's awesome. Yeah. We've tried to get together. I've had a couple of projects, you know, that I had spinning for a minute and uh, had him come in as director on them. You know? so Very cool. We're always looking out for each other. Very cool. Did that, uh, did that help you decide you wanted to produce some of your own stuff? Well, you know what it is, is that I guess that I just didn't know how good I am, you know, because you just think, well, other people do that. So you right. just stay in your lane, so to speak. But then, um, you know, I would champion some of my friends work and mm-hmm. you know, writing screenplays. And I, t- I went to Cannes twice and pushed, you know, lots of projects around had great meetings and created some really good relationships in that, on that side of the camera right. with a producing partner. And uh, she lives in Georgia, which is, which took me to Georgia for two and a half years. And that's where we made Charlie's Christmas, Switch, which is the first movie I produced as a producer, uh, Lionsgate distributed our movie. So it's available, you know, every Christmas. I think you can find it anywhere right now. Yeah, Charlie's Christmas Wish, but it's a family Christmas dog, homeless veteran themed movie that's out every Christmas for sure. And uh, my dog, Charlie, was the dog Charlie. I trained her. She wasn't a movie dog, but I trained her. So I was the handler. Um, Mm -hmm. I helped, you know, I helped form the story and the script. I can't say that I wrote any of it legally. Um, And you know a set design and you know and it's all on a dime but it's so fun and we and we really had a vision for it sue ann was the driving my producing partner in that was the driving force in that in reference to getting all the money right and uh, raising the money she's a genius genius and so yeah Mm -hmm. and we produced our first movie we did it two chicks did it and it was really that's awesome awesome. then we had the crew quit on us at one point (laughs) You know, payroll's not coming through because yeah. of it was COVID and stuff. And, you know, uh, so, yeah, there were lots of bumps, but that just makes you prepared more for the next one. Yeah. And understanding how the game works or doesn't. And so really good learning experience. I see the gift in all those learning experiences. Yeah, that's 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 the tough one is to, to stick it out and ride and ride the roller coaster, so to speak until it's through because sometimes people give up a little too soon. You know, I, I find a lot of people that talk to me, they're like, ah, should I, should I keep working at this? Should I keep, t-? of course, if it's your dream, keep working at it. Keep See, trying. I, think, I think, I think if you have to ask someone else what one should do for their own life, they're just not paying attention to their surroundings because sure. God in the world and whatever they, you know, whatever they connect to is guiding you every day. 
Absolutely. But you pay attention. But sometimes Absolutely. they say you can't see it right in front of you, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, and there are signs everywhere. Like, I, I see that, too, because I know, like, I, I've actually, with the writer strike, and I'm totally behind it. It's been hard in, in, in this business while this writer strike's been happening. And I've had a lot of projects get kind of halted, but that's okay because mm -hmm. it's about the long haul and it's about the end result. And, uh, you know, I, I am, I am determined to stick it through because I feel that the stuff that I'm involved in is worthwhile. And there are signs everywhere that come up every single day that tell me the same thing. Now there's a writer's strike, but it doesn't stop you from writing. No. So I don't, I don't see the strike. Sorry. Whether I'm pushing it, whether I can produce it, whether I can actually right. actually get it done, that's another story. But it ain't right. a writer's strike to me because I can write any day, yeah. any day. Yeah, it's, that's kind of what I'm saying is I haven't let it stop any of the things that I'm doing. I'm getting them into place and doing what I can do. And and while that's all happening, and then whatever I can pull the trigger on as soon as it's done, mm -hmm. there it is. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay, so I'm an actor, right? And your face is they kind of know who you are. And I just had skin cancer surgery uh, a little over six months ago and the scar the cutting i could show you a picture you 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 fans of horror you would love to see those friggin stitches on my face <laughs> this is this is like six seven months post-op but anyway i have a graph that was here and the scar goes up here and across here uh -huh. down here my nose this scar here is all connected to one so they 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 okay ready here's the gory part so they slice the skin off my face and they pulled it out, right? Then they tilted it down. That's why this little puffy cheek thing is right down here now. <laughs> so they pulled it out, pulled it down. Now there's a space here. Oops. So they cut a piece off here, sewed it onto there, and then wow. stitched me up. So this is me with a little bit of makeup on. But that's six, seven months post-op. So talk about writer's strike, <laughs> the actor's strike. Yeah. You can't you really look, act while you're recovering. No. No. Well, you look fantastic and I'm glad that you are through that. That's that yeah. is a tough tough ordeal. I yeah. I had an accident myself in 2021 that left me partially disabled. Wow. I fell out of a studio ceiling that was 16 feet high and shattered a foot and very similarly had to have my foot cut open and all kinds of stuff like the Home Depot put into it to hold it together. So, yeah, wow. it's uh, you just got to keep pushing, doing what you can do. Yeah. So, you know, um, I've always been writing. My first book was Racquetball for Women when I was 19 years old. They asked me to write an instructional book for women. I said, OK. And uh, it's still on Amazon somewhere for probably 99 cents, if not less. Um, but that was 19 years old. And then, and then I wrote. Uh, how I found myself with correct living, which is about yeah. how I eat healthy. And I've been doing that for over 45 years, mm -hmm. I guess. And I have an audio book out. I don't have an e-book yet, but I was going to show the cover. Um, it looks like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. And um I've been eating basically no meat, no dairy, no sugar, and no refined foods for over 45 years, incorporating a lot of Japanese Eastern uh, philosophies right? Uh, on yin and yang and acid, alkaline, sodium, potassium balance. I don't count calories or grams of fat. I eat whole foods grown as close to being just out of the ground as possible. And then, you know, um, yeah. And what's in season, what's indigenous to the area in which I live. And yeah, and, and cook most, mostly my own meals because it tastes better to me anyway. Sure. Well, the fresher the ingredients, the better things are anyways. Yeah. So in my book, I talk, it's my story told through food, like what I ate growing up, what made me change, you know, and I, and I raised all three of my kids this way. I, my pregnancies, I didn't eat eggs and I didn't do all the normal stuff. I did what I do, you know, a lot of sea vegetables, seaweeds and sea, uh, fresh fish, wild caught organic all the way juices and all that kind of stuff was what how i raised my kids and then i breastfed them and made their baby food mm -hmm. and um yeah and didn't vaccinate them either so i know that's a, that's an interesting topic that people love to talk about but 
Yeah, no, I believe uh, that child gets all the antibodies it needs right from the mother's. That's Absolutely. How, that's how it's Absolutely. created for every animal. And um, so I just went that route, you know. Right. And then I read a book called, uh, I don't remember what it was about. It was on vaccines, but the other side, because you don't get access to the other side much. I had to kind of find it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so I made those decisions. And I have amazingly healthy, beautifully bright, uh, giving, caring three sons. And I raised them all this way. So it worked for me and I share it and how I do it in my book, how I found myself with correct living. And then my boys also do a chapter. I had them write what it's being, what it was like being raised, being different and eating that way. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. And there's some recipes in there and all of that. So that's the second book. And then my, my newest one is Tender Love. And um, that I, one's, that one's brand new, right? This just came out. Yeah. This yeah. is on Amazon. Yeah. And it's a, it's a collection of diary stories from Tinder. I dated on Tinder and uh, I wrote about it. And it's erotica, romantica, erotica. They're short stories. There's 14 dates. And um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Racy stories with Tony. <laughs> well, you know what it is? It's interesting. Um, and I, it, I can get a little bit serious for a moment. Not serious, but a topic that is very prevalent always. But, you know, I come, I'm a woman. And so I have a history. Yeah. We all have a story. We all have a story. And part of mine, because I say to people in the funny jokester way, my life is not like a Jerry Springer episode. It's like a Jerry Springer season. Oh, boy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That's how varied it is. But in this yeah. instance, uh, what I found cathartic about writing these stories, in, in, in the, and I've never read erotica, it's not something I've written before, uh, but I was single for about seven years, dating often, and, and learning a lot about myself by dating. And right. so I would do these little voice memos after the dates. And so I, because I, I wanted to date till I never was single as an adult. Right. I was marriage back to back three kids. So here I am. And so I figured it out. And when I listened to those, I went, this would be interesting, a collection of dates. So I wrote them, the voice memos into mm -hmm. stories. And then what I realized is it also empowered me because I come from uh, child abuse, sex abuse mm. uh, in my past. And it's, I don't have any issues that you would think, you know, I should be in the gutter. <laughs> right. <laughs> when you hear, I just went to this amazing, wonderful uh, lady, Yumi, a hypnotherapist, for just this deep relaxation thing she does. Mm -hmm. And when she takes your story down, oh my gosh, she's like, uh, that you're here and like above ground. <laughs> yeah. So this Tinder love is very empowering. So I, it was taking my sensuality back instead mm -hmm. of being a woman of servitude to men. Yeah. I. I took it into my own hands and learned about myself and that there's many ways to love and to be loved. And so, yeah. And so, yeah, they're page and a half. You can read a, a, a date a night and you're done in two weeks. Yeah. That's, it's super cool. What I, what I love about your story is it seems to me that you, you are and kind of always have been a woman of, of self empowerment because you were never afraid to jump in and do things. Mm -hmm. You were never afraid of any of that. You just decided I'm going to take the chance. I'm going to do it and, and fuck it. And that's, that's so important because you knew the things you wanted and you went after them. And, and despite all of the, the garbage that you went through and, and now in your, in your rediscovery, it, it seems that like you are definitely like a shining light to other women. And I think that's so important. Yeah, that's, I, I mean, I write about, thank you for saying that. I mean, um, I write about it, about the author, you know, and, and there's some people who review the book too in here, but I write about it that, yeah, it really empowered me to, yeah. to pay attention, you know, to relationship. And uh, the, the men I describe are very real. I mean, those were real men. I've changed the names. I might've put it in a sure. different town. Uh, the pictures, some of them are the real guys, the pictures, right? As it doesn't show their face and it's my picture. I took it. <laughs> um, but some of them are friends of mine that I said, Hey, I'm writing a book. You would make a great Frenchie. You're my Frenchie. 
And mm -hmm. I said, here's the story. And you would, your picture, one picture of you would represent my Frenchie in this little story. And he said, absolutely. So uh, that's, some of them are that way, but yeah. Um, and that's just volume one. That's only 14 dates. <laughs> so you have more. Great years. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's awesome though. I mean, it's, it seems to me that, that, something something like that coming much later in your life um i'm sure i'm sure it was more than cathartic to do but like oh, oh, taking yeah. taking ownership of your your whole life because there's always you know I, I i was a child of abuse too and and like there's pieces and and that you don't feel like you have and when you rediscover that and that you actually do have control of it yes and you can retrain yourself to realize that. I call that in my correct living world that I teach a person how to design a life instead of just endure one. Yeah, it's pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. That's powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I hope that you get to share more of that with the world. Yeah, that'll, that'll, that'll come definitely. But tender love is really, it's, uh, it's, it's unique and it's, it's being um, developed into a television series. Oh wow! So, yeah, super I mean, cool. Really, didn't, cool. You, didn't did you correct me if I'm wrong? But did didn't you start to develop one for Correct Living too? Yes, yes, I did. I did. I, I had, thought I remember talking to you about that when you were. I at the had show. a whole thing going. Yes, in fact, I have. Excuse me, my website TonyHudson.com. I didn't have TonyHudson.com for a while because someone had absconded it when I was not financially on it and pay, right. pay my GoDaddy account. So I lost it and it was almost a grand to get it back. So it took Ouch. me a while <laughs> to get it back. And so my website now has a presence at least, but I don't have a lot of content on it yet, but I, I right. want to go there with a lot of my content and just take social media and, and push it to my website because I have all arms of who I am there. You know, I have my books. Right. Um, I want to do more of, you know, blog and podcast stuff daily, Yeah, and, you know, do it, do it there. You should even do a correct living, um, podcast. That might be kind of cool to do. Exactly. No, exactly. And I know a guy, I know a guy, <laughs> you know a guy. there's a disembodied voice here. That's, that's telling you. No, I, <laughs> and, and the thing is, is the thing that I really like about where I come, my angle, because I'm not like someone who's 300 pounds and now look at me now. I, I've always been similar size. Right. So right. It's, it's not about that in reference to my story. What my story is, is that I've been doing it for 45 years. I'm 62 years old. Yeah. You know, I still. And you're very active. You're ball. super active. Too. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm racquetball, tennis, golf. Yeah you know, still yeah. do cartwheels and I dance and I invent a <laughs> workout and, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It's in other words, my life is just beginning is how yeah. I feel really. And I've fallen in love with an amazing man who's very creative, but also a great businessman himself. So yeah, having the experience of uh, falling in love in an older age and it's not to couple to create a family. It's very different. Oh yeah. It is. It's different for sure. Mm -hmm. It's it's about that long term. But if you want to know who he is, he is the guy named Stephen. <laughs> oh, he's the story. <laughs> I, anybody listening, listen, listen, hang on. Anybody in this podcast listening right now will know that Stephen, and the byline is he's a contender. <laughs> and there's two dates. No, there's five dates with the Stephen right in a row. Day one, day two, day three, day four. And there is Stephen. That is truly Stephen down in Cabo. That's where he was living. He yeah. took me down there many, many times. But this was a particular date or two or three. <laughs> and then Stephen is also another guy. So you guys are getting inside scoop. No one's going to know this because he took me on a trip, which was very bucket list. Yeah. Romantic bucket list. And um, I said, okay, I have to write about this because this was amazing. <laughs> and I said, but you get to name the guy because, you know, and so he named him Tyler. <laughs> and the picture for Tyler is actually us. <laughs> um, out of focus, but us, because I blurred it. But it's us. Yeah. On East Cape. 
So there's some fun um, connection of real stuff. And I fantasized stories because not every uh, Tinder date was great. No, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's an understatement. <laughs> yeah. So there's it's fantasy. In fact, I even talk about what is the definition of fantasy, right? Right. So, yeah. Right here, fantasy. And this is this this is this book is available on Amazon or yeah Amazon you, books and you right. get it um it's there's an ebook and okay. there's a I think it's nine ninety nine and and the prices are going to go up I think June twentieth okay I just got to notice because I have K, a Kindle print on demand uh, account and so you get the book within like a couple of days if you do paperback I think paperback is more fun right. You know, yeah, I'm I'm somebody that has fun. to have physical media. I like physical media. I, I'm yeah. not really much I'm for reading on a computer. Bring it to wherever I am, folks, yeah. and I'll find it. But um, and please leave a review. <clears throat> that would help me greatly. Awesome. So so <laughs> to to kind of wrap this up, um, I know it's a, it's a little bit early, but maybe we can we can touch on some things here. Since you've had such a a broad career yeah. in film, television, writing, everything, like, is there any, like, what was the best advice you ever got? The best advice. I don't know if I got any advice. I think I'm an observer. I don't yeah. miss anything. So when I'm on set, whether it's live television or it's yeah. a film set or a commercial set or whatever my participation is, doesn't matter. Uh, I'm always learning and I'm always mm -hmm. watching and paying attention. So, I mean, Gary Marshall told me he created a team because he wanted people that understood him like that. He didn't want to have to explain himself every friggin' time. So once he found somebody that worked great as a cinematographer or as, you know, wardrobe or whatever, and they could gel together, creating a team and letting them know, all right, you work with me, I'll, I'll hire you always kind of mm -hmm. thing. So they're loyal. They become loyal. And that makes the machine run really well. Right. Um, that I learned. Uh, Walter Miller who is now gone, but he, he did live television. He, uh, the Grammys for 30 years, the country music awards produce and direct and all that. And I learned a lot from him. Mm -hmm. Uh, I learned to stand up for myself with him only because he was rude to me. And then I stood <laughs> up for myself and as, as a choreographer, I've choreographed the country music awards five years in a row. I've done eight of Dwight Yoakam's videos of, as a choreographer and been wow. in three to five of them. He's a friend of mine, and and uh, he's an amazing talent, Dwight Yoko. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I've dabbled. I'm, you know, I'm not a triple threat. I'm what a, I'm a deca threat. Because <laughs> you want to know how to do everything. <laughs> well, I, That's I've just, awesome. I've just written a film um, that I'm in the finishing of the third draft called Living on the Fringe, which is basically part of my story because I lived out of my car for about three years. Uh-huh house surfing, couch sitting and all that. And um, actually that's reverse. But anyway. Um, <laughs> we yeah, have a lot so, in common. I did some of that myself. <laughs> so I, so I, so I, I took a real situation and wrote a movie about it. And um, it's inspirational movie, dramedy. But uh, right. yeah, character driven. Have a lot of great people already committed to it. And uh, some wants for some stars. I want Ryan Gosling to play mm -hmm. Brandon. And um, yeah. So I wouldn't mind Michelle Pfeiffer playing my part and I direct because it's my story. Yeah. But wouldn't that be cool? I write it. It's my story. So she played like she plays herself because it's at yeah. this age. It's not when she's playing herself younger. So I don't know. I think it'd be very impactful, but they like names. She's a bigger yeah. Yeah. But well, you maybe know. you just keep keep it out there, keep putting it out there, and the right stuff will fall into place. I know. I I know your career has been that way, and and you're you're very similar to me. It doesn't seem like you give up till you get what you want. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah. No, I'm. I mean, I'm still championing a, a project called The Poet that Carol Hummel wrote, and that's yeah. the wife of a set designer, Bob Hummel. And she's an amazing writer and it's, you know, period film. We want, you know, Peter Dinklage and Colin Farrell and it's in wow. Ireland. And 
it's an Academy Award winning movie. I, it's wow. just, I see it. And yeah, I mean, I'm still championing that. So I have a whole thing going on. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds sounds like uh, sounds very similar to what I do. <laughs> I keep as many things moving as I can. And usually when someone says, what do you do for a living? I say I'm a creative because it's too hard to explain. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> People like to put me in that kind of, oh, you're a special effects guy. No, no, no. I do way more than that. So. Yes, yes. I mean, <laughs> you get to a certain, you know, higher level in one of the areas and that's what you're yeah. for. But, you know but for. of course. Yeah, no, I mean, I have an album of songs, original songs, country. Wow. Songs. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, there isn't a, t there isn't a spot that I don't touch. That's it's super quite, cool. Quite but that's, but that's, see, that's what you wanted to do with your life, right? You didn't, you didn't, it's like, like you were talking about earlier, it's like you get these little signs that kind of guide you throughout your life. And I feel like that's how I followed it too. Okay, like, can I tell you, can I tell you a Tom Cruise story? Yeah. Okay. I shouldn't have said his name because now I ruined the fucking book. <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, so I'm coming into a uh, casting and director's office. His name is Lynn Stallmaster. He's he's casted so many movies. You look him up on IMDb, L-Y-N-N, -N, Stallmaster. Won an Academy Award a few years back as an honorary. Anyway, he brings me into their office to do a read, just a cold read for the office to know who I am. I will read for Gail Eisenstadt. Gail Eisenstadt says, oh, can you hold on? I want you to do that again. Goes and gets Tony Howard. Now, Tony Howard is now a big agent, a woman. Yep. I think he's CAA. Anyway, she was an assistant to Lynn Stallmaster at the time. So she goes, I want you to do that again for Tony. So Tony comes in. Please do that again. I read again. And I went, okay, you got to come back and read for Paul. So Paul Newman is directing and starring in a movie called Harry and Son. And so he's casting for the son, his son, and the girlfriend. And so I'm reading for the girlfriend of the son. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what I read in the office for Tony and Gail. And now they have me come back to read for, actually, I first come back to read for Lynn Stolmaster. Then they have me come back and read for Paul Newman, which I didn't know at the beginning. Right. And Joanne Woodward is there. I show up on a Saturday. There's no one in the office. It's totally empty. And I'm feeling, this is strange. And mm -hmm. I go in, I'm sitting like in the dentist's office, a little window, you know, and you're just sitting there waiting. And all of a sudden, <laughs> Tony Howard comes out. She goes, oh, good, you're here. And I went, yes. And it's an eight-page dramatic scene. And I go in, chat a little bit with Paul. Joanne Woodward's in the corner doing needlepoint, you know. Mm -hmm. And he had another producer with him, Tony and Lynn. I read with Lynn chatted a little bit nervous i don't remember a lot of the chat but left and as i left there was a guy sitting in the waiting room and you do that actor nod like hey good luck <laughs> yeah and i leave out the door down the hall and and i'm at the elevator and then tony howard pops her head out she's tony are you still there and i went yes i am and she goes and as we're walking back in she says i would like you to read with this actor from new york mm -hmm. because he's here and so this is like his fourth or fifth callback and there's no rehearsal. He says, Tony, Tom, Tom, this is Tony. We shake mm -hmm. hands, walk in, follow Tony in, and do this eight-page scene. Now there's not a dry eye in the room. Everybody's crying. Oh, wow. <laughs> Joanne Woodward stopped the needlepoint. Uh, we have this amazing conversation about how great we were and how inspiring. And we ended the scene forehead to forehead, and, and, and Tom whispers in my ear, you did better than anybody I read with in New York. That's awesome. You know, and then we leave as two excited actors and go down the elevator and then walk across the street of Pico Boulevard to Love's Barbecue Pit and sit for four hours having coffee, jacked out of our minds about this experience <laughs> this night reading for Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward. Right. Neither of us gets a part. Oh, wow. So in reference to where this lies in Tom's career, uh, Taps had already come out. Right. But Risky Business was in the can, but it hadn't come out yet. Wow. So no one really knew Tom Cruise as Tom Cruise yet. So uh, he was just a dude, you know, we, and I was just an actor. Right. And we had a great experience. And then that was it. I never saw him again. And he be, and then Risky Business came out, and then he became Tom Cruise. Right. And now I'm doing live television and working the Oscars. I worked them for years. I stood in for Ellen every time she hosted. I was Ellen for the rehearsal. 12 days mm -hmm. up to the Oscars. It's a whole nother series I'm writing called The Stand-In. Anyway, 
<laughs> I'm sitting at the Oscars doing this other job as a stand-in. And a stand-in there, you have to do everything that the real people do. Read the prompt, pretend to win, give a speech. Everything has to be real because it goes live. Okay? Right. So it's not just standing for lighting, even though the, that's what they say. So Tom Cruise is coming to rehearse Best Picture. Now, this mm -hmm. is the year that Steven Spielberg and Kathleen Kennedy are nominated for War Horse. Okay? Producer, director. I'm sitting in Kathleen Kennedy's seat. My cohort, another Tom, uh, is sitting in, in uh, Steven Spielberg's seat. And right. what they do up to rehearsal in this is they have everybody who's nominated in Best Movie, Best Picture, practice winning so that each camera guy can follow everybody up. They can, everyone gets a practice. So we'd only been two times that somebody has won. So we had, a, I'm saying to my cohort, have we won yet? Mm -hmm. Wait, have we won? Are we going to? Am I going to walk up on the Oscar stage and Tom Cruise is going to hand me an Oscar right now? Is this what's going to happen? And, he, and, he, and he's doing his thing and he goes, and for rehearsal purposes only, he has to read what's in there. War Horse, Kathleen Kennedy, Steven's War. So we have to jump up. We hug each other. We have to run down. And here's Tom, you know, handing me, handing me the Oscar. He's going, wait, who are you? How? You look. <laughs> and I'm on camera. It's live. They're in the truck. It's war rehearsal. <laughs> and here I am having this freaking conversation with Tom Cruise, thinking the stand-in is chatting up the movie star. Oh, no. <laughs> this is all going to be in the television. So in the wings is, you know, the, the stage manager's going, what the hell is she doing? I just can't believe it. <laughs> and, and, and he's just going, oh, my God. And I said, yeah, you and I, Harry and Sonny, goes, oh, you look amazing. I can't believe it. Now, my cohort is doing his Spielberg speech, and I'm supposed to be over there with him. So I said, hang on one second, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Real quick and be Kathleen Kennedy. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So then I run over, I do it, and then the trophy girl, you know, does her escort us off. And so he and I get to walk along and chat, of course, while the stage manager's going, What the hell is she doing? <laughs> and then they whisk him off to some press, and that's the last time I've seen Tom. But that was 30 years from seeing him from the audition. Wow. Him handing me an Oscar on the Oscar stage. Wow. Ever. That's cool. That's I have a, a lot cool of stories thing. like that. That's that's awesome. So so to to kind of wrap this up, I wanted to ask you what advice would you give to anybody up and coming or that wants to do this? I I, I it seems so obvious to me with someone like you because you you've just you're just a go getter and you do you're not afraid of anything and I and I love that about you. I well, think you're I such an inspiration you said because that of that. twice and I'm so loving you for saying it. Um but I'm actually afraid every time I do something new, but I do it anyway. But you take the gamble. That's my point. See, that's, not that I'm not scared. Right. Well, okay. Okay. Uh, but that's fair. That's fair. Because I, I do get scared and my heart goes and my leg. You, you're a risk taker. And that's that's important, too, I think, because because people scare themselves out of doing things. Mm -hmm. And I don't and I, and I see you as somebody who's taken those risks and done it anyway. And they've paid off those. Yeah, risks well, one of my off. one of my biggest things, I guess, to encompass a lot of who I am is that the adage that creativity is greater than knowledge. Yeah. So um, the idea that knowing a lot of things, going to college and getting a degree, a piece of paper that you put on the wall, which is what we've been taught. Yeah. Over and over and over again. If you don't do that, you're a loser. You're not responsible. You're all the things that they tell us that that is negative. Yep. And I just always has been the black sheep in the idea that I went a different direction constantly. Every time they said go over here, everybody everybody's going over here. I said, mm, okay, I'm gonna go this way then. <laughs> and I just kept doing that, whether it was food, whether it was picking a career, and um, I always follow what makes me happy. Now, am I happy all the time? No, uh, I should be. And be learning how to do that, which is just basically gratitude and appreciation in every moment. Because if you're present in the sure. moment, there's no worry. There's no fretting about the past or worry about the future because you're yeah. like right here, right? Yeah. So, yeah. And, and then the, the, here's the biggest thing. So that was it. Creativity greater than knowledge. And so I love, I take my life and I write about it, mm -hmm. whether it's a script TV show, book, I take my life. And, oh, that's, I learned that in the movie Cross Creek. I was with Mary Steenburgen, Malcolm McDowell, and Rip Torn. Mm -hmm. 
Martin Ritt directed that movie. It was my second movie I did. And the, uh, the character that Malcolm McDowell played was an editor that Mary Steenburgen character, Marjorie Rawlings, was trying to get published. And she kept writing these gothic romances of time which she never lived, right? And trying to tell these stories. Of course, she would accompany her manuscript of these gothic romances with a note about her new life. She left New York and went to Cross Creek, Florida, which is bought an orange grove so she could write because her husband right. was being, you know, snooty. And the letters mesmerized the editor, Max Perkins, real person. And so Max Perkins is reading these letters. So he finally wrote her after the fourth Gothic friggin' romance, you know? He sends back, he goes, please stop writing that of which you know nothing of. These letters of Cross Creek fill me up. I can't wait to read the next one. I can't wait because it's a real, you're experiencing it and you're telling me and I, that's what I want more of. And so she wrote The Yearling. Wow. And that's the true story. And Mary Steenburgen is amazing in that part. Beautiful movie. Uh, and I had a supporting role. Of, yeah. So, yeah, it was great. That was such a great experience. But that taught me that whole, mm. that whole idea. So that's the, that's what you would suggest for anybody is just don't be don't be so afraid that you stifle yourself, right? Yeah, I mean, creativity greater than knowledge, passion is what drives us, you know. And and having challenges. I I'm five feet six inches tall, so if I'm standing up and I'm attempting something, but I fall flat on my face, I'm actually five feet six inches closer to my goal. <laughs> Each time that I fa fail and I'm failing forward. Yeah. And so I see the gift in it. And that's the other thing. So I look at my life in the past and I say, all right, I've had challenges and bumps and lots of child abuse, incest, moving every three or four years, never having a dad. I want five different dads. It, it was chaos. It was survival, you know? Yeah. And yeah. so, with, yeah. So with that challenge, I look back though, Every challenge and hurdle pushed me for protection, for redirection, to have a different experience. So then I reach for something else because I just realized and experienced what I don't like. I don't like this right. and this and this and this. So now I, I now I search for other things. Now if there was no pressure on me, no way for make, then I'm just skating and life's good. But right. the challenges have made me reach. So I see the gift now. Instead of trying to get caught up in the roller coaster of uh, I deserve better and it shouldn't have happened. And they said, blah, blah, on all of that. I say, show me the gift. Yeah. Well, I there's that. And then, and then for me, there's, there's there. also the, when you, there. even through the failures, it's like, what did it teach me? Right. So, so you're learning constantly and you're learning what not to do and you're learning what you can do. I know that the only thing constant is change. Change is expansion. Absolutely. <laughs> so change is expansion. Yeah, and so if I'm, yeah. if I'm changing constantly, because we are all changing constantly, whether it's our blood cells or our eyes or our things or whatever, um, <clears throat> then that means that I want to participate in it and put it in the right direction. I want to yeah. expand where I want to go, designing a life instead of enduring one, instead of being in the back seat and letting someone else take the wheel. You know, we'd be bouncing around like whatever the hell they're doing. Oh, yeah. It's about us going, no, I'm going to go here. I'm going this way now. Yep. Well, that was fun. Now it's over <laughs> here. You know, and it's just choosing. And then if you don't like it, you don't beat yourself up about it. You say, I, why did I turn right? What an right. idiot. You know, no. I know now I don't really like that so much. Right. Well, I'll hang over here. And that's what life is. Yin and yang. Yeah. You know, night and day balance. And so, yeah. Show, yeah well, showing me one, the of, one of the things I've also learned is, is that like through, through some of my therapy and stuff, I've also learned that that you can have a bad attitude about something or you can have a good attitude about it. And either way with that experience, like let's say waiting at a drive through or something and you're getting impatient, you can either have a good attitude about it or you can have a bad attitude about it. Either way you're waiting, <laughs> you know? Well, what is impatience? Yeah. Thinking so, that you're better than everybody else. There could yeah. be some machine problem. There couldn't, it's not like <clears throat> that the incident of making someone wait is all about us. Right. Right? Oh, they're making me wait? How right. dare they? That is such an egotistical <laughs> way to maneuver, and it's exhausting. Yeah, it really is. And and <laughs> by human nature, most of us are fairly narcissistic anyway. But, yeah. you know, if you can kind of work past those things, I think it really helps in getting through life. 
So. Well, that's kind of like the person, you know, who's the last one to at the jetway to get on a plane because his wife's in labor. Yeah. And he's pissed off because they shut the doors and then wait, I'm here. Why? 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 Angry, calling everybody. You know, the wife's delivering. Yeah. <clears throat> and then realize the plane crashes. Yeah. There's a reason. He's spending the whole time being grateful that he's sitting, you see, but he had to take it some so you, we don't know what the reason for the redirection is and it's usually absolutely different. and if we just flow with it i think that's uh, a better yeah. way to go yeah well thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story with us because i find it very inspiring uh it, it, within myself, because I, like I said, I'm, I'm also in therapy and I'm learning some of these things still today that I, that are patience and endurance with certain things and, and realizing that stay focused in the moment. Don't, don't treat it like a past experience because every, everything that happens is still really a new experience. And it's always a gift. In other words, you yes. know, that there's always a reason that it's happening. Whatever yes. it is, there's a reason always. So if we know that deep down, why get our panties in a bunch? Why get all in a tizzy about something when yeah. we can just sit in the, we can go, okay, I have a redirection for protection. Don't quite know what it is yet. Yeah. yeah. But usually that's the case. So I'm just going to say, be kind to myself. Yeah. You know, that's sometimes the hardest part is being kind to yourself. Oh, it's a it's a tough one. We beat ourselves up subconsciously yeah. often, I believe. Yeah. And we don't really need to do that, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for sharing this with us today. I yes. really appreciate you being here. Thank you I, so much for having me on. Let me share. Let's uh let's give everybody your website again and and any any of your social media stuff all of that stuff and, and yeah sure post it down it below as well for people absolutely uh, okay cool thank you invisible man you uh, yeah my, so my website is tonyhudson.com and then with an I T O N I Hudson H U D S O N Tony Hudson dot com and then my Instagram is Tony Hudson nine the number nine because someone already had Tony Hudson. My Facebook is just Tony Hudson. I have Twitter, but I don't have a presence on there because, because, and uh, <laughs> I'm on LinkedIn as well. I, I check in there every now and then just take a look. I don't really, I don't like how that website maneuvers, so, but I'm there. Uh, but my IMDb is really good. I'm under 10,000, which is really good for an IMDb star meter. I don't know if you know what that is. That's pretty yep. cool. I do. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. So, um, yeah, just keep, look forward to creating. And, uh, let's do something together, Nick. Absolutely. Come on. <laughs> we have we have lots to talk about. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So thank you again. I really appreciate you. You're a wonderful human being, and I'm so glad that we got to meet. Yes. And thanks for spending your day with us. All right. Thank you. Oh, thanks for coming back on. Hello. Yes. I finally got to talk to Sarah from Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> uh, did you have any questions because i know we i mean i know you just signed off so i don't know if we're off off but no not yet uh okay. what was it like to film with a dog you know it was really uh challenging and you had to be really focused and i had to create tricks to get her to you know look a certain way and stay looking there but then follow me i had to go behind the set and the people and the cameras to get her to go and just and, it, you know, I had to just make it up as I went. It's not my forte. That but. adds a whole other layer. To, and that was like to production on that, I'm sure, because that yeah. was one of the films you produced, right? Yes, I produced yeah. it. And so it was my dog, which gave us the idea to ah. make a movie. Charlie can be, be Charlie. And Charlie already knew how to, you know, high five and sit up and do the basic. <laughs> but I had to teach her how to stop, stay from way far away. And then go, Kump! and then she would, you know, run to wherever I was. <laughs> And yeah, it was, so I had to be, and then when my producing partner wasn't on set, I had to wear both those hats at the same time. I was doing yeah. the dog and, and sometimes occasionally also play, I star in it playing the mom. I play the mom mm -hmm. role. And so I had that role as well. So for the dog, the mom, my son played my son, <laughs> 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 you know, I did the set decorating till two in the morning so we could use the kitchen. <laughs> It was all hands on deck and it was really fun. I learned a lot. You should watch it. I mean, it's a friendly little movie, but yeah. 
Yeah, you've had such a long long career. It's it's hard to cover everything, but uh, yeah, you've done a lot, and it's it's uh, it's important to to people like us to keep people inspired. That's why we want to have people like you on the show. Yeah, no, I, I'd love to have you guys read the book, and then yeah, absolutely, that's the next step. And then let's have this conversation because I think uh, I think it's I think it's an important conversation empowering women. You know. Yeah, one hundred percent. Tender Love Part 2, coming soon to podcast <laughs> platforms everywhere. And thank you again, Tony, for joining us on another episode of your favorite podcast, Hypodermic, the pod that sticks you deep. I'm TJ Bowser, the pod boss. I will see you guys next week. That's Nick Benson. That's Tony Hudson. Thank you, everybody. See you next time.